Thank you for coming to Optimizing Linux Games for AMD Graphics using GPU Perf Studio 2. Please welcome Tony Heuscher and Gordon Sally from AMD. Great, thanks everybody. Um, I'm Gordon, this is Tony. Hi. Welcome. Here's the background to our talk. So GPU Per Studio 2 is AMD's performance and debugging tool for graphics applications. Initially, it was developed to support DX and OpenGL on Windows only, and recently we've ported it to Linux. So this can be very useful when developing games for Steam Linux, and especially useful when optimizing games for AMD GPUs. So we're here today to tell you about the product and demo it working uh, on Linux. The way we're going to go about this is give you an introduction to the tool with an overview of uh, how it works and the various usage configurations. We're going to demonstrate it working uh, on Linux with a, with a test app and demonstrate the main tool features. And we're going to show you a little bit about how to data mine your app using Per Studio 2. And we'll actually be demonstrating this with a Linux Steam game. Then we'll follow up with a little bit of a summary and some questions at the end. So let's kick off with an intro. So really, it's a suite of tools that can be used to debug and increase performance on AMD GPUs. It has an integrated frame profiler, frame debugger, and API trace with CPU timing information. It supports OpenGL 4.2 applications on Windows, supports DX11, 10.1, and 10, and now supports Linux. It's a lightweight, no installer, no change to your game, drag and drop suite of GPU tools. You can run it from a USB drive, no need for Visual Studio integration, runs with game executables, no special driver or compilation required. So the advantages are it's a very fast startup and edit and debug cycle with your game. Very easy to fit into your tool chain. The frame debugger is the main tool that you use to capture, playback, and view the contents of a frame. It allows you to scrub through the draw calls, visualize the GPU time for each of the draw calls, view all the game resources and state bound at each draw call, and inspect the resources at each stage of the pipeline. You can also view, edit, and debug shader code. The frame profiler is the tool that you use to identify costly draw calls, detect GPU pipeline stage bottlenecks, and investigate those problems at the counter level. The debugger, shader debugger allows you to edit live HLSL or GLSL inside your app while running in the tool. For HLSL, we also support um, shader debugging, which you can actually step through, step through your shader code and add breakpoints, et cetera. That's not available in GLSL at the moment. And also, you can use this tool to com uh, compare before and after edit performance using the profiler. And we'll actually be demonstrating that uh, today. The API trace is a CPU side uh, information tool. It allows you to inspect all of your API calls with their arguments, see the CPU timeline information for each API call, and visualize multi-threaded usage of the API. It also natively supports DX11 command lists and deferred contexts. So who uses it? Well, it's widely, wi widely used inside AMD by the AMD developer technology engineers. These are the guys that go out into the, the games companies and optimize and debug game titles in conjunction with developers. The AMD driver performance team, these guys improve GPU benchmarks and titles at the driver le level. And the AMD driver team itself, they use the tool to inspect apps that cause driver problems and rendering issues. And the AMD game compute team, they uh, create the uh, tech demos for new GPU hardware, and you may be familiar with some of the ones that we're showing here. And of course, the most important group of users are the external users, the graphics developers who use the tool in the development of DX11 and OpenGL graphics applications. And one of the useful things about the tool is it can be used in different usage configurations. So you can use it locally on one machine. This is the mode that we've supported now since the inception of the uh, project. So here we see the client and the server running on a Windows machine. Or you can use it in remote usage mode, where the client and the server are running on two separate machines connected by the network. And this has the advantage now of being supported not only on the Windows server, but on a Linux server too. And the advantage of running it in this mode is that you can run the game at full screen and get a more accurate uh, profile of how your game is actually performing. So also within the local and remote debug session environments, we can do things like this. So we can uh, run the client on the Windows machine and connect to a Linux server. Here we're running Left 4 Dead 2. And we can also run a separate uh, version of the game and, and the client 
on the host Windows machine. So why would you want to do this? Well, let's say that we're porting a game from Windows to Linux. One of the natural steps you might do is convert it to OpenGL running on Windows first. And here you could contrast how that performs on Windows to how it performs on on Linux. And also in the conversion from Windows GL to Linux GL, you may introduce bugs in your code and you can basically sync up the draw calls uh, on your Windows client with your Linux client and investigate the render states and basically debug what's going on. So it's a very useful tool for inspecting a working app and a not working app. Also, you can compare the performance of DX running on Windows to OpenGL on Linux or OpenGL on Windows to OpenGL on Linux. And this is actually the scenario that we'll be demonstrating today. We've got a laptop here uh, with Linux, with Steam on, <coughs> and we'll show you how uh, this, this arrangement works. Dual remote debug sessions are also possible. You might use this scenario if you're testing on different families of GPU hardware, uh, on Linux or on Windows, and you can combine that information and compare it on the client, uh, on the client machine here. So very useful uh, for when you're working on discrete graphics uh, GPUs there. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how Per Studio works um, to give you an idea of you know, how it's possible to port it to uh, different graphics APIs. The GPU Perf client is a .NET app that only runs on Windows. And we have a GPU Perf server.exe, uh, which is basically a simple web server that's responsible for starting your game. So basically, you give the server a bunch of arguments that start your game process. And we append a DLL, or in Linux's case, a .so, with a micro DLL uh, to inside your game. And this connects back to the web server using a shared memory system. And then when your game starts rendering uh, with its graphics API, whether it's GL or DX, we detect those graphics API calls with our logic, and we load a server, in this case a GL server, and that's the logic, that's the, the, the main core engine for Per Studio. This is the code that records the API trace, performs the profiling, and generates the API trace. And this has a hook into the shared memory system. So when we're developing and we're debugging a game, Basically, the client is making HTTP requests to the web server. These get placed in the shared memory, drop down to the GL server. Data is extracted um, from a constantly rendering uh, frame and passed back to the client. So the advantage of this format is we're separated by the network layer here. So if we want to port to another API, all we have to do is port our perf server.exe, which is a couple of hundred lines of code, um, put in uh, the micro DLL and GL servers, port those, and we're only taking a small component of the tool across um, rather than you know, taking the UI and everything. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about how to uh, use it with Linux and give you a little bit of background to the project. We supported OpenGL since the inception of the tool, but support for OpenGL grew and became serious during the development of Brink and Rage, where we used it in-house at AMD to debug driver issues and for GPU profiling. Next came Valve. They used uh, Per Studio 2 in the porting of Source Engine to OpenGL. They found it was the first tool that would work with a large OpenGL application, which was great for us. And they also used AMD's GDebugger. Um, this is a tool that can help you in the GL creation code by checking for common OpenGL uh, creation errors. Uh, GDebugger is end of line. You can still download it and use it, but the features have been um, superseded with or integrated into uh, Code XL, which um, also supports uh, OpenCL. GPS2 was then used by Valve in the porting of Source Engine to Linux. Well, how did they do that, considering it only ran on Windows at the time? Well, what Valve found um, was that most AMD driver issues on Linux also existed in the Windows driver, and so they could be debugged and reported on Windows. And the tools ecosystem that Valve were using to analyze the data um, that they were bringing back um, was already well developed, and they didn't want to port all of their analysis tools to Linux. So, and they found that most of the work could be done on Windows. So at the time, there was no real need to move you know, the entire tool chain to Linux. The drawback of Perf Studio 2 only running on Windows was it was not possible to profile the GPU directly on Linux using Perf Studio 2. But at the time, we had GPU Perf API, which is a, a low-level library that allows you to access the GPU performance counters on the AMD hardware. And this had been available for Linux for a while and also on Windows. 
and developers can freely download this library and integrate a GPU profiler into, our, into your own tools. In fact, Perth Studio and Code Excel use this library under the hood anyway. And of course, with the release of Steam for Linux, uh, GPU tools are even more important to the game developer community at large. So we started to port Perth Studio to Linux in mid-2013, and we specifically targeted uh, Steam for Linux games. We really wanted to support the work that Valve was doing, and also standalone OpenGL applications. So where are we right now? Um, Perth Studio works with all of the Steam for Linux games that we've tested, and we're targeting Ubuntu 12.04, Initially, we may support other distributions as required, but this is all we're focusing on for now. It's currently in beta test, and we expect it to be available at the end of Q1 2014, so expect more information on this at GDC. So stop talking, show me. Uh, what we want to do here is show um, Fermark um, GPU benchmarking application. The reason we want to show this is it's quick to start up, and we can actually demonstrate most of the features of the tool. Um, and to do that, I'm going to hand over to Tony, who's going to talk a little bit about the Linux setup. The idea for this presentation is that people can take this presentation, and when Per Studio, either in your, your in our beta program or when you download Per Studio, you can use this as a guide to get your applications um, running. So we've got some sort of lower level information here. And of course, um, Linux is less draggy and droppy than Windows, so there is a little bit of shell scripting, but not too much. So I'm going to hand over, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Tony, yeah. right? <clears throat> Gone's going to stop talking, I'm going to just test start talking. If you put the slides back, that'd be great. Um, so when you'd go to our website, you can download the Perf Studio server when it's available. It'll be free, obviously. Um, as Gordon said, you, can, you don't need to install it, but for our benefits, we just put it into a development folder. It'll extract it and generate the 32 and 64-bit versions of Perf Studio, depending on which uh, executable you're debugging. There's also a readme that will also duplicate these simple instructions. To install the Fermark demo, we've just downloaded it from the website and put, copied it into a test apps folder. To run it, we just, we've just we created a small script. Obviously, um, Linux isn't very drag and droppy, as Gordon mentioned, so we you generally use scripts to speed things up. It's only a two-line script. First of all, we change the directory to where the uh, executable lives. Normally, this will be where your game natively runs, so it can get its uh, resources and things. And then we call the GPU perf, perf server. We give it a minus S option to tell the, the server that we're using a script file uh, rather than a general executable. And this one, we're demonstrating the Fermark windowed demo, which was provided by Fermark, and it's in their downloads. So to run Perf Studio, all we do is change the directory to the scripts folder, which we have done, and run the Fermark demo, which we'll show you in a couple of minutes. So once we have the server running, we need to connect the client. The first thing you need to do is go to the Windows Settings um, drop-down and bring in the Settings dialog. And um, what GPU, Studio, GPU Perf Studio does is it intercepts the timing calls. So if you set this to freeze, basically any time your application references or calls a timing function, you will get exactly the same value back. So your game will be frozen in time. This works for some games, for other games, and for Valve games, we don't generally use the time spoofing, so we switch that to none. Um, you only need to set the settings uh, whenever you make any changes. Perf Studio remembers the settings from instance to instance. And then we click the connect button to connect the client and server. We're then presented with another dialog box. We insert the um, Linux IP address of the server, which you can get by opening a console window and typing ifconfig. We then need to use the port number, which in, by default on Linux is port 8080, and then we click Connect. Then we'll be presented with another dialog box, which will show you all the um, uh, running applications or OpenGL apps in the Linux machine. Generally, there'll just be the one application that will be active, so you don't really need to do anything here, apart from press the OK button. And then the client will be running with the server, which will be running your game, and you can interact with your game as normal. So the typical scenario would be you'd vote, you play your game until you get a place of interest where you want to um, dig down and have a look. If there may be bottlenecks, you may be getting a frame rate which is lower than you'd expect. When you get to that point, you press the pause button to do a frame capture. Now, what a frame capture does, it intercepts, it records all the API calls that your, your application is making to generate that particular frame. So we can play that frame over and over. 
So we've been then presented with another dialog box, which will give you some more information about the frame capture, and it'll tell you it's OK when it's done. So now we're in a state where the tool is ready to be used. The, the three tool highlight buttons have been presented to you, and we can now carry on digging deeper and finding out what the problems are. So if you could just go to the Linux machine, I can just run that script very quickly. And you can see in the background there, we've got Perf Studio logs coming up with the PerfMark demo running. OK, great. So what we're going to do now is attach the client. So if we could switch the video back to uh, my computer, please. Great. We've opened the client. So I'm going to do what Tony says. It's actually a lot faster when you just do it. There we go. Click Open GL. Hit pause. So we now pause the game. Um, can we switch to Tony's uh, view and see what's on his computer right now? And we can see that the uh, firmart demo is paused on a frame. Perth Studio is now playing back all of the API calls. That's actually uh, Perth Studio doing the rendering now. The, the game is frozen. And if we could switch back to my computer, please. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open the first tool, which is the frame debugger. So we're running at 720p. Uh, it's not the ideal resolution for showing the client, but it, it's not too bad. Um, it, it should be better if you use a, you know, a higher resolution uh, monitor, but we'll, we'll make do for now. So what I want to do is point out the um, along the bottom here, we have a draw call slider where we can drag through the draw calls and release and all of the various windows update. And uh, one, one thing we notice here, we've got this very, very tall bar here. This is actually a GL clear call that's taking a, a very long time. And it's actually masking away a lot of the other uh, GPU um, time information. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to boost this up so we can see the other. There we go. So we can see the other GPU times here. So here we can see we're on draw call 13 out of a total of 103. We can see how long in milliseconds this draw call is taking on the GPU. And we see the function name and the arguments. The other way that you can navigate through your draw calls is via this uh, index list here. So this is a uh, draw call 2, draw call 3, etc. And we can also get the GPU times into this list. And we can order them by uh, the amount of time it's taken for that, so the most expensive one is at the top here and decreasing on the way down. To the right of that, we have a model of the pipeline. So we have our vertex shader stage here. We can see the shader code and the assets being used there. Um, we're not using a tessellator here or a, a, a geometry shader. So I'll just go to, straight down to the uh, fragment shader. To the right of here, we have all the texture resources that are being used. So I can click on those and I can open that up in a texture viewer and I can inspect the mip maps. And I can view in data mode if I need to. And this is actually the raw data um, that comes back out of the driver, so it's very accurate. To the right of that, we have our GLSL code. And below that, we have our shader constants that are being passed in. To the right, we have our, our state information. We've got our sampler shader uh, state information here and our render state information. So at any point in the uh, draw calls, we can see the current state. And we have the geometry that's being rendered down here on the right-hand side. So as you can see, this is the main tool that you'll use to understand um, the makeup of your frame. And if you're using um, you know, a game engine and you're pouring assets in, you may not necessarily know where shaders and where information, uh, you know, what the final look of your frame is in terms of draw calls. So this is an ideal tool for, for doing that. Let's take a look at the API trace. Um, this is a CPU side tool that shows you all of the API calls, not just the draw calls. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see there's 602 of, those, two of them, so six times more than the number of draw calls. We can see the... Um, interface being used on each of the draw calls, so which version of OpenGL or ARB functions are being used. And we can see the function name, which is color coded, and the arguments being passed to that call. And we have a timeline view at the top here. So most of the calls are actually taking place in this little batch here. And using control and uh, drag with the mouse, I can zoom in to these areas. And I can scroll with my mouse wheel and go in even further. And if I mouse over uh, some of these calls, you can see the start and end time and duration 
And the interesting thing about the API trace is that it is synced with the frame debugger. So if we select a, draw, a API call here, the frame debugger will move to that draw call. So let me show you by dragging this window over here. And if I select in the frame debugger, the API trace syncs up. So there's two ways of getting to the same data here. Let me put that back. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the API trace. If it was a multi-threaded application, we'd have more lines up here, more rows. Let's take a look at the uh, profiler. This is our main tool for um, detecting bottlenecks and drilling down to the counter level. You can do a quick analysis, and this should tell us if we're GPU bound or not. And indeed we are, it's a GPU benchmark, so we should be. If this was not GPU bound, then you're probably using the wrong tool. You want to use something you know, more CPU based to optimize your CPU code before you actually get down to the graphics. Um, looking down here, we have a list of all the counters available. We generally recommend that you select the timing group to begin with. Now I know we're not using a tessellator or a HS or a DS or a GS, so I'll just switch those off. And what this will do is give us a snapshot of what's happening in the pipeline on each of the draw calls so we can see um, where spikes may be occurring in the, in the pipeline. So I'll click profile. And this is the profile data here. So it's come back, and the most expensive draw call is at the top. It's that nasty geo clear again. But let's go to the first draw call that actually is doing anything of substance here, and that's this guy here. Could we switch to Tony's machine now and see what's on his uh, screen? So what we see here is the geometry that uh, Perstudio is monitoring right now. That's the, uh, the pink area there. And we can see the rest of the rendering around there. Um, if we can switch back to my uh, computer now, that'd be great. Very good. So um, looking across here, uh, we can see the shader is 96% busy. Uh, VS is not very busy at all at 3.1%. And at 96%, most of the work is being done in the PS. And the texture unit's considerably busy too. So what we can do now is that we can drill down into the pixel shader, select those counters, and find out what's going on in there. So we'll click profile again. And what we can see here is that um, the number of pixels being rendered in this particular draw call is 386,000. But look at the total up here, it's 43,414,000. Uh, this is a GPU you know, stress testing uh, application. So basically 43 million executions of the uh, pixel shader are occurring. And because we're selected this draw call, if we move to the frame debugger, this is the actual shader code here that's being executed. So it's, it's not a particularly you know, large uh, shader code, but it is happening 43 million times. So that is where most of the expense is going here. So what we're able to show there is we could find which part of the pipeline is busiest, and we can find out why relatively quickly. If you want to know uh, what the, te the, um, the counters actually mean, then you can just mouse over, and you get a brief description of what's going on there. OK. So um, that is uh, the client connected to a remote Linux machine. We can actually run the same demo um, on the Windows machine here in OpenGL. Here we see it going. I can open up another client. And I can connect to that. And I can pause it. Open up the frame debugger. I'm going to have to uh, take the scaling down here so we can see the GPU times. So we see a similar pattern of GPU times along here on the Windows version as to what we're seeing on the Linux version. We see exactly the same number of uh, draw calls, 103. 103, it is just a straight port from Windows to Linux or the other way around. I don't know which way they started. But we can see it's the same tool. So we're at the point now where we could um, you know, profile the Windows application against the Linux one. So we can actually you know, compare and contrast how the drivers are doing uh, on Windows and on Linux. Now there's one thing, I'm going to shut that down now. There's one thing that I want to show you also, which when you've actually discovered what your um, expensive shader is, what do you want to do about it? Well, I want to demonstrate a sort of an edit and profile cycle here. So this is a fairly expensive draw call here. And I can see that we're doing four of these smooth step functions. So 
One of the things that we can do now is edit and take some instructions out and see the effect on performance. So what I'm going to do is an individual profile of that draw call, call before, click OK, and we can see it's 0.410 milliseconds. Now what I'm going to do is edit the shader and take a few instructions out, compile it back in, and uh, let me scroll to the end here and we can see the render target there we go so we're still rendering um, if I take the wireline view off actually if we can switch to Tony's computer that'd be great please yeah, we can see there's not actually that much difference in rendering. So visually, there's not too much you know, difference. So this obviously, this is a value judgment that I'm making. But what I can do now is go back and reprofile and see the effect of that edit. And we can see we're down to 0.378. So we shaved a little bit of time out of that shader. Now, if that shader was to be using a th you know, 1,000 times or 100 times, that would be quite a considerable saving. So obviously, you know, we're just changing the shader and taking some code out and you know, miraculously it's faster. But this is a realistic kind of cycle that you would do. You're trading you know, the, your visual representation against the cost. Um, and this is an ideal tool for doing that. Can we switch the video back, please? There we go. Great. Thank you, Tony. OK, so um, that's the end of that demonstration. I'm going to flip back to the slides now. So what I want to talk about next is the potential for data mining your game using Per Studio 2. As we mentioned before, um, Per Studio 2 has web-like behavior. Um, basically, it modifies your game into a server that responds to web-like requests. And that's indeed how our client works. Uh, just basically says, sends web requests to port 80 on Windows and 8080 on Linux. And you can actually see these requests for data in the console output of the server. And a history of the requests can be accessed in the client. So you can just go to help, server log. And here, we just got a big list of all of the commands that have been sent from the client to the server. So debug messages are included. Um, so debug string output is put here, and any error message is generated by Per Studio. And these are requests for individual bits of uh, data to come back to the client. And the requests have the following form. We've got the IP address of the Linux server, the process ID of the game that's running, the API that we want to talk to, OpenGL. FD is short for frame debugger. We want to talk to the frame debugger. In, in particular, we want to talk to the pipeline part of our system, the fragment shader, and get the code view, the, the code back, basically the GLSL code. So it's possible to script these uh, web requests. And as part of the work that we did on Far Cry, we actually needed to identify um, that sections of HLSL code were being used in certain draw calls. So we were able to write a script to re retrieve the HLSL code from each draw call in the frame and search the code for keywords that would identify the code. So this is pretty much what it looked like. Um, <clears throat> we connect the client to Far Cry and pause the application. And here we can see the um, uh, commands arriving at the server. And what we can actually do is open a browser and type these commands directly into the uh, browser here. In this case, we're looking at the pixel shader texture stage. We're looking at texture two. And we've requested a thumbnail image. And obviously, it's uh, some kind of normal map that's coming back. And you can also request XML data. So state data from GL comes back as XML. And here's the shader code. In fact, we can get every piece of data that you need to reconstruct um, a draw call or the frame back using these web requests. And internally, we have a tool that can generate a C++ application from that data. So we can run you know, a single frame or a single draw call over and over again. But the other important thing here is it's very easy for you to create your own client for Per Studio. So if you don't want a, a Per Studio client that runs on Windows, you want to put one on Linux, or you want to do a special interrogation of your um, game using uh, Per Studio 2, you can write your own scripts and UI to do that relatively quickly. So here's a script that we've written. It basically starts at breakpoint zero, goes to breakpoint 50, and searches for the Steam string. 
So what I want to do now is just hand over to Tony. He's going to talk a little bit about how to set up um, uh, the Steam games uh, to work with Perth Studio. Yeah, so because Steam games take a while to um, start up, I've loaded, preloaded Dota 2 on the uh, laptop already. Um, a couple of notes for Linux users. Um, currently, web access comes, web requests go on port 80 on Windows. We're using port 8080 uh, because any port below 1024 isn't available on Linux in, in user mode. Uh, we have another script that gets distributed with Perl Studio to do that. It just makes our scripts easier so we can run them on Windows and Linux. Um, Steam games are currently in this folder, and the Dota 2 executable is currently located there, the, the one that we're using. We're currently working with Valve at the moment to try and simplify this method, but this is the way that we figured out how to get things working as quickly as possible so we can go through the Steam games and make sure that they all work as quickly as possible. In, so there's a script file in there called Dota 2 that we need to ed make a couple of edits to. The first one, we need to change the LD library path to point to the uh, Perth Studio server folder. In this case, we're using the x86 32-bit folder. And then we need to change the game debugger to point to our 32-bit GPU Perf server. To run the game, we just need to make sure that the, per the um, Steam executable isn't running. If it is, it'll show, it, it'll show up in the app bar. This just makes sure that when we run Perf Studio from the console, any output from Perf Studio will result there, so we'll be able to see our output. Each Steam game has its own ID. Um, Dota 2 is 570. So to run our game from the console, we just issue these couple of commands. Pretty straightforward. Over to you, Gordon. Great. Um, so what I want to demonstrate now is a, a few more profiler features and how this script actually runs on Dota. If we could take a look at what's on Tony's computer, please. So here we can see uh, Dota running. I'm just loading the client on, on my computer right now, starting that up. So what we have here is two slightly older laptops. They're both running 5,000 series graphics cards. They're very, very similar. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is obviously it's a relatively simple way of getting here and demonstrating the server working for you. But more importantly, we know the profiler works on Windows. We've been testing and working with it for a long time. So we're able to contrast the profiler results on Windows to those that we're getting on uh, Linux driver to compare and contrast and see if we have any bugs actually in um, our own code. So it's a useful setup. Okay. So I'm just connecting now, and I'm going to wait for a um, particular scene that I want to come up. There's a couple of guys that are going to come in top right. I'm going to wait for them to just run down here. I'm going to pause just there. So we've now captured Dota 2, this particular frame. And if we could switch back to my computer on the video. We're going to open the frame debugger. And here we see, along the bottom, uh, draw calls. We've got 667 of them. We see some noticeable GPU spikes here that we might want to take a look at. And everything is working the way that uh, it was in the, in the previous demo. Um, I can open up the uh, render target image, and we can see it's upside down. Quite a lot of rendering in GL seems upside down to where it is in, uh, in, in DX, but we can fix that with our Y flip. And this is the point at which, you know, if we were inspecting quality, we might want to dig in here, see if we've got any, you know, you know, black pixels where the rendering's not occurring, or, you know, we can basically visually inspect at this point um, the output in a reasonable detail. But what I wanted to talk about is a different way of navigating through your um, draw calls. So I'm going to basically do a very, very quick profile with just the GPU time. And this is a, a sort of more advanced usage of uh, the Per Studio profiler results. Um, what we have the ability to do is uh, basically store or organize your draw calls based on the shader that they're using. So if I click on Fragment Shader, this will basically sort the draw calls into buckets. And each of these buckets contains draw calls that use the same Fragment Shader. And the bucket at the top is the one that is the most expensive. So if we want to edit and make any optimizations to shaders, this is probably the shader we want to use because it's having the most effect uh, in terms of GPU time in the scene. So if I click on that, I can move to my frame debugger and I can see 
here's the shader code. Now, there's actually not a huge amount going on here. Dota 2 is not particularly renderingly heavy. It's not particularly taxing the GPU. We don't need to optimize it. This is just a demo to show you that this is a, a very quick way of identifying the, the best opportunity for low-hanging fruit in shader optimization. So I'm going to take that off. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go to a draw call. And I want to show you the script working. So what we're going to do here is we're going to edit the shader. And I'm just going to add a comment in there, Steam compile it, put it back into the game. And what I'm going to do now is I have a batch file. Here's my script. I'm just going to run that script from the batch file. But we're going to switch to Tony's computer now, because I want, to, want you to see the effect of uh, the script on the, com uh, on the server. So I'm going to run the script here. And what you should see is very, very fast move the draw call breakpoint through 50 frames as we get that shader code back onto the client, uh, back into our script. So I'm running the script now. And there we go. Very quickly, it uh, fires through 50 breakpoints, um, advancing the draw call, extracting the shader code, bringing it back to the, um, to the script. So if we can go back to my computer now, we can see the output of the script. And we found the string Steam in Fragment Shader at draw call 2, 7, and 18, which is kind of interesting because we only edited it at draw call 8, sorry, draw call 7. But if we go to 2, ah, that's 3. <laughs> There we go. We can see Steam is in that shader too. So this is another way of finding exactly where a shader is being used in, in the frame. It's actually being used in three draw calls in the first 50 draw calls. So this can be a useful, you know, powerful feature if you're you know, really trying to understand where snippets of shader code are being used. If you've got some great big you know, shader compilation phase in your, in your content and you want to track stuff down. Also, it shows you the power of scripting if you decided to create your own um, your client for usage with Perl Studio. OK, that, I think, is the end of the demos right now. So we'll go back to slides. How are we doing for time? Oh, yeah, we want to talk a little bit about API Trace. So API Trace is an open source project that allows you to trace OpenGL and DX um, applications to a file. And then you can replay those traces for analysis. And uh, you can use API Trace to capture OpenGL traces on Linux or on Windows and play back on either. And um, Per Studio supports the playback of traces, allowing you to debug and optimize using a small subset, subset of, a, of game frames. So let's say that you're developing a game uh, or porting to Linux, and you notice some rendering issues or some performance issues. You can use uh, API Trace to record a section of your game, dump it out to a file, and then play it back through Per Studio and just analyze those few frames. So it's easier than starting the game up each time. And it's ideal for capturing and sharing them between developers. And in fact, this is one of the ways that we've worked with Valve for, for a while now, is by getting traces of you know, new renderings and uh, game content from them, getting Per Studio working with that snippet, and then giving them a version of Per Studio. And this really helps us to upgrade and keep our OpenGL support up in the tool. But it also is a very, very powerful feature. And they do it. If, you, if you're really considering porting to Linux, then get to use API Trace, very powerful tool. Wanted to talk a little bit about Mantle and tools for Mantle, more importantly. If you're not familiar with Mantle, it's a new graphics API. It's not necessarily relevant to Linux right now. Um, and it's really designed for GPU efficiency. Um, it overcomes some of the bottlenecks of traditional graphics API and, under, uh, and unlocks uh, new performance features of uh, the latest generation GPUs. And really, it's designed to solve the small batch problem, and that is rendering hundreds of thousands of objects very, very quickly, where in traditional graphics API, the uh, CPU side tends to back up, and you can't you know, drive the GPU um, to its fullest potential. So um, this is a, a, a snapshot from the Oxide Star Swarm demo, which shows uh, thousands of uh, objects in flight. Um, Mantle is not necessarily for everybody. 
Um, GPU management is in the hands of the developer. So all the safety that takes place in current drivers for um, GLM Windows is pretty much stripped away and you get to mallet GPU memory and create your own synchronization points and manage it at a very, very low level. Um, and that's really where the speed up occurs. Um, but it's not for everybody, it's fairly dangerous. Um, so Mantle is designed for dense scenes with thousands of objects, highly threaded CPU work to feed the GPU. And um, you know, we've been developing tools for this now, and I, I thought it interesting to show you the difference between the API trace we we're seeing for sort of Dota and what we're seeing from you know what, what we we term like a modern renderer. Um, you know, where we've got you know a couple of thousand API calls in existing games, maybe four thousand, maybe twenty thousand. For a typical sort of mantle app, you're looking at two hundred thousand API calls, um, densely packed as well. So let's just zoom into this uh, CPU uh, trace. Once we get down to 0 0.1 milliseconds, that's the time from here to here, we can still see that there's many, many uh, submissions uh, to the GPU taking place um, from the CPU. And we see the over, overlap of the uh, various calls on the thread. So we're able to really maximize performance on the CPU and drive the GPU um, with Mantle. So the reason I'm showing you this is that if you're interested in Mantle development, we are developing tools for it. And you can contact uh, you know, AMD um, for support, support in that. And it's reasonable to assume that Mantle Windows apps would ship on Steam uh, anyway. But it gives us unique uh, problems that we need to solve for uh, dealing with these, this new style of where it's almost console-like rendering uh, on, on the traditional sort of PC. So the latest version, um, we, which released a couple of months ago, has support for the, the new Hawaii cards, the R9 uh, series. We've improved the multi-threaded uh, support. Um, we've added pipeline-specific counters for OpenGL and support for OpenGL compute. And obviously, currently, uh, we're developing Linux and tools for Mantle. So to summarize, Per Studio works on Linux, supports Steam for Linux games, and is available at the end of Q1 2014. So uh, just like to thank, thank a few people who have helped us with the project, Rich Geldreich, Jason Mitchell, and all at Valve who have used and supported the project. Dan Ginsberg, Peter Lorm, and Graham Sellers for all their OpenGL support, and especially Val for inviting us to attend and present uh, here today, and all of you guys who showed up. Thank you. Uh, there's some download information for our tools, and we'd just like to throw it open if there are any questions right now. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I have two small questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, can uh, Perf Studio 2 be used to uh, for full screen OpenGL application? Uh, another one is, uh, can this tool be used for OpenGL ES 2.0 rendering? Okay. So the first question was, can it be used on a full screen OpenGL application? Yeah. Yes, yes you can. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the second question was, is OpenGL ES 2.0 available for Perf Studio? Yeah. Good question. Not right now but very soon, it's, it's planned. OK, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no more questions, uh, we'll just say thank you and uh, goodbye. Yeah, thank you.